Life can be complicated, confusing, and difficult. Have you ever felt you needed some direction? Learn how to take responsibility for your life and why this can renew you and your faith. Next on Living Smart. Production funding for Living Smart with Patricia Gross is underwritten in part by Halliburton. Hello, I'm Patricia Gross. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Today's guest, Sister Elizabeth Mozina, will share the basic psychological principles for a healthy spirituality. I'm going to start with a video. It's Discovering Our Human Potential. This video plugs into all the basic principles of effective living. Sister Elizabeth Mozina has invited those who have taken her effective living course this Saturday. And so we thank you for bringing us here to this moment of peace in the beauty and safety and restfulness of the cynical. They're here to beef up their spiritual muscles. Six statements, six truths by which we would live, and we ask that you empower these statements. Her course on positive affirmations took a lifetime for her to learn. Her religious order is the Sisters of the Cynical. Their mission is to help people find time to reflect and pray. My passion was to help people arrive at the truth. And I didn't have all the truth, and nobody has all the truth. And we're working together to know what is God's will for us. And I've come to discover that God has only one will for us, and that is that we learn how to love. Sister Elizabeth didn't come from a very religious family. She was the youngest of seven and unexpected when she was born. My announcement of my becoming was not <laughs> was received with great joy. My mother was not well, so I probably made up my mind in the womb that I was going to be worth having. But it's made me very conscious of uh, people's needs to be accepted and to work through sometimes some of the limitations uh, that we bear within ourselves. During World War II, she and her sisters volunteered in a hospital. There, an elderly man transformed her life. I remember uh, asking one of the nurses if I could have some oil, and I uh, massaged his feet. And it was such a deep movement. I was, I was almost in tears when I was doing it. And the look on his face, I think it was um, a seed was dropped in terms of doing something very simple for somebody And it seemed to make all the difference in the world. I uh, looked at what I chose to do as a deeper kind of nursing of the spirit. She joined the order at age 22, and the next few years adapted to religious life as best she could. I know my novice mistress, uh, I, I think I tried to act holy, and thanks be to God she broke that out of me. She said if I kept on acting holy, whatever I was doing, that she would send me home in a week. In time, she became director of novices and worked to improve the sister's self-esteem. She recreated a new effective living course already started by other cynical sisters and opened it to all denominations. It was a healing of people's images of themselves that prepared them to believe and accept God's unconditional love for them as they are. Sometimes when we read our lessons here, and, uh, and I reflect it. it. It really turns out better, doesn't it? The Effective Living course happens a few times a year, but Sister Elizabeth meets with a group every week, as she has for the past 25 years, to cope with everyday challenges through prayer, meditation, and faith. Well, there you are. There you are with your best friend. We were Sister Mary you. Dennison has known Sister Elizabeth for 45 years. I uh, like to see her in front of an audience because the audience... Uh, brings out a great deal of energy and life in her and vice versa. And when it comes to fundraising, she uses both drama and comedy. Whatever she does, it works. Every year, she sells raffle tickets to pay for expenses at the Cynical, which in turn offers scholarships to those who can't pay. 
I do it with the energy that comes from trying to earn money to keep our cynical going. But I know how important the cynical is for people, a place of quiet, a place where they can come and refocus, a place where they can come and ask the Lord to lighten the burden on their hearts. Her course on effective living is one of the most popular at the cynical, and Sister Elizabeth keeps getting positive feedback even after four decades. What I hear from people is basically it changed my life. It helped me to start over again. It gave me a sense of myself. It opened a path of freedom. It healed me of the baggage that I've been carrying around. As with many courses, many participants claim the instructor, not the material, makes the real difference. And credit Sister Elizabeth for the success of the course. If you're depressed or if you're in joy, mm -hmm. I admire very much Sister Elizabeth's energy in her self-giving. She has this marvelous gift, this magical gift of words. Our body is negligible in comparison to the spirit of our lives. We are spiritual beings. God loves me no matter what I do and keeps calling me to accept that love and to love God in return. That's spirituality. You value yourself as you are and accept yourself as you are. Sister, so great to have you here. It's great to be here, Patty. It's Thanks for inviting me. Sister, why did you decide to do a course on effective living? I felt there was a great need for it. When men and women, women and men, come to the Seneca, so often their story is burdened by their past, their ways of thinking about themselves. Uh, there's so much negativity in the world around them, and they've imbibed negativity from the very beginning of their lives at times. And that stands in the way of exercising their potential, exercising their giftedness. And uh, I just felt that that's the place to start, to loosen them up and to help them to know the wonder of their own being and how much God loves them as they are and how unique they are. Now, self-esteem, that seems to be one of the things you wanted to tackle mm -hmm. also with this course. Yes. Why is it that we have, in general, low self-esteem? What causes that? I think what causes it is um, the fact that uh, from the very beginning of our becoming, uh, there is an expectation in the way we love one another that is, um, it, it's, there's connect, there's a, um, expectation on the part of the people who receive us into the world uh, and we're all loved conditionally right, we're loved right. if and we're loved when <laughs> and our antennae goes out very early in our lives and we realize that we have to measure up if we're going to be loved and we learn very early what the expectations are mm -hmm. and then if we don't measure up uh, there is that fear that we will not be loved so we guard ourselves and we use the words I can't and I have to in order that we're sure that we're going to please, we're going to measure up to the expectations, and therefore we will be loved. Really, only God loves us unconditionally. Right, right. I mean, it's hard for humans because we are not conditioned to love unconditionally, right? That's so right. So that's what you're trying to that's teach right. people. What about criticism? We're all raised with criticism, mm -hmm. and some of it can be very painful. Yes. How do you deal with criticism, and how do you understand it, and how do you do it right? Well, uh, one of the first reactions when we get to the section of the Course talking about criticism is that people don't like it. It's, it's a negative word. It has negative connotations. It's filled with fear. You can tell by the body language that uh, neg criticism is not one of people's favorite words. Critique, they'll understand. They'll Why? Take Why is that? Well, critique seems to call for the object of the criticism. Not the person. Not the You're person. You're separating exactly. the action from the person. That's right. And when you separate the two, then you can really help a person learn something by the criticism. But usually what happens is that the two are put together and you hear words like, you always, you never, you know, how could you do that? You're, you know, you just spoiled everything. An example would be of you're trying to tell somebody how to do something, and then when they do it, they do it wrong, and they spoil your part in whatever was being done wrong. And the criticism is couched in, you never always, and you end up 
you know, partially destroyed in terms of your person right, because right. you were picked on. The example that I use from Scripture is very apt. When the woman was taken in adultery, was discovered in the action of adultery, and everybody was ready to stone her, and Jesus goes through the dialogue of let he who is without sin throw the first stone. Right. But the most important part of his response was to say to her, everybody has left, has no one condemned you? Mm-hmm. And she says, no one, Lord. And then he looks at her and says, neither do I condemn you. It's a dumb way to love, lady. This is my right. translation right. of the scripture. Right. But He's not talking about her. It's that's about right. her actions. He's talking about her actions. <clears throat> he said, that's, don't love that way. That is not love. Right. right. But you are not condemned. Okay. And that's what we need to keep in our mind whenever we deal with someone, teaching them something, telling them something, correcting a mistake. It's not the you. It's the action. The action. And it can be and fixed. And that is so important. Let's, let's go to the first affirmation. Mm-hmm. And now affirmations are in the present tense. I want you to explain to me before we talk about affirmations. What are affirmations mm-hmm. and why are they in the present tense? And then we'll go to the All first right. one. All right. We talk about giving the people a tool when they come to this course, something tangible. Everybody has read self-help books. When they close them, well, what do I do now? And what we say is we're going to give you a tool. And, of course, you have to use it to have it work. And this is what the tool is. The tool is to... Look at what you want to change within yourself. I, I, uh, I can't speak in a group. I hesitate to ask questions because I sound so dumb. And I want to be able to ask questions in a group to exchange ideas. And I'm going to have this new job, and that's going to be expected of me. So I want to change and diffuse the fear and anxiety in me to do that. So I sit down and I write a, a goal. I want to be able to talk easily in this group, discuss ideas, and be very positive in my presentations. That's the goal. So I translate that goal into a positive present tense personal statement. It's happening now. It's happening now. Uh, I don't have the past. The future is not here yet. And there's a principle, as I think of myself now, Mm -hmm. in the present tense, I become what I want to become. If I think of myself now as I was in the past, I resurrect my past into the future. So I sit down and rewrite the goal into an affirmation that says, I can easily present my ideas to a group and I enter into dialogue with great ease and great readiness. Mm -hmm. It's a positive. It's about me, not about somebody else. It's present tense because I have only the now where I live. Right. And it's a very positive statement and I repeat that repeat that diffusing my negative fear Mm -hmm. and repeating the positive until I become that sure of myself and that manifests itself let's go to the first one God or higher power loves me and I love myself I like myself unconditionally explain that one to me because people ask you why you do say like and not love myself unconditionally because I am asked to love everyone and when I love everyone I'm concerned for their good I wish them well. And it's harder to like everyone than it is to love everyone. And that's the very reason. It's, and it's, uh, it's, it's liking, uh, um, you know, they get into, uh, well, what, do, I like, uh, do, I, do I like Hitler? Do I like Saddam Hussein? Do I, all these big figures of people who have done hateful things. And I say, you know, let's get off the big, these big issues. Get down to the people you live with. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to like everybody the same. Mm-hmm. But when you say, I like myself and I like other people, it's it's um, letting them be who they are, accepting them as they mm-hmm. are. And that is repeated again in one of the other affirmations. So like is very important because it's harder to like than to love. It's easier to let somebody be who they are. When you say, I like somebody, it's... When we say, I love them, yes, I do. I don't wish them harm. But to like everybody is a little more difficult. What I found interesting about this affirmation is that it starts with you because you can't do anything unless you love yourself. That's right. Right. That's the bottom line. Uh, That's the bottom line. The second one is I value myself and others, and I only use positive Mm self-talk. Why is it important for us to talk to ourselves in a positive way constantly? First Even of, if we're doing something yeah. wrong. First of all, we're always talking to ourselves. There's always a chatter going on within ourselves. But when we talk negatively about ourselves, put ourselves down, we squelch the potential within ourselves to use the gifts that are ours. 
we're negative about ourselves, we're not life-giving. And um, th- to value ourselves is to really praise God, thanking Him for the gifts that He's given us. We don't really appreciate the wonder of our humanness and the uniqueness of our humanness. So to value ourselves is to hold ourselves dear, is to appreciate the gifts that we have. And the more we do that, the more I can appreciate your gifts, Patty, because I'm at ease with my own and I claim my own. And so that's important. And to value myself as me, not just what I do, my job, uh, what what possessions I have, the car I drive, how I look, the clothes I wear, all the externals, that's just stuff. Mm -hmm. But to value myself in my own person, in my own uniqueness, to be at peace with myself, makes it much easier for me to accept you. Right, right. Again, it goes back to loving yourself first before you can love anybody else. That's the bottom line, again. Third one. God loves everyone, or higher power loves everyone, and I have unconditionally warm regard for all persons at all times. That's the hard. That's a hard one. That's Why? The hard Why one. is that the hard one? Well, because, <laughs> because we have to love everyone, it, yes, even though we don't want to. That is just. Uh, I, I've worked a lot with uh, with AAs, and uh, <laughs> and of course they've had a rough time with themselves and with other people, perhaps more so than than others of us who are not addicted in that obvious way. Uh, but it is the hardest. It's just, uh, and again, we come to the big sinners in the world who have revealed through their actions, you know, how difficult it is to to love them, much likes to like them. Uh, it's, God has only one will for us, and that is that we learn how to love. No matter what we do, the choice is, you know, the fact that I'm a sister doesn't make me any better than anybody else. Expect, uh, people expect you to be better, but you're human. I'm human, and, and my, my, my learning and my struggle is the same as yours, is to accept people as they are, work with people. That's the vocation for all of us. Mm-hmm. And when we make the affirmation that I, I have unconditional warm regard, that's the key. I'm not asked, I certainly am asked to love and be concerned about the good of another person. But in that affirmation, the word warm regard is the key, that I look upon you with warm regard, that my eyes are not cold in your regard. Mm -hmm. You know when someone looks at you coldly, and you know when someone looks at you warmly. Mm -hmm. And what we aim to do and what we're capable of doing is looking at someone with warm regard, believing in their potential, wishing them well just by the way we look at them and by our tone of voice. Mm -hmm. We're not Pollyanna-ish about the whole thing. We're not pretending. We believe in their potential that doesn't always manifest itself. And isn't this an important affirmation for forgiveness? Because when you're angry with someone, when you hate someone, when Mm -hmm. you have negative emotions towards someone, it'll come back to you. Yes. So you're learning to forgive with this That's right. And if you don't forgive, the poison you know, does something to you. Destroys you. It destroys you. That's okay. right. Uh, fourth affirmation. I can relax at any mm-hmm. time and every day through my affirmations. I am healthy in body, mind, and, and spirit. spirit. Why is this important, particularly in modern times? The stress is the disease of the day. And to make that affirmation and to visibly allow yourself. I, when I say it to myself and when I say it with a group, I find myself just taking taking a deep breath and I can easily relax at any time and every day through every affirmation I'm healthy in body, mind and spirit. And that begins to affect me as I say that. It calms you down. It does. By the very voice that you say out loud as you say your affirmations out loud and that'll come when you speak a bit about the technique of making your affirmations. Right, right. Uh, Yeah, because we will talk about how many times you're supposed to say them and all Mm -hmm. that. Fifth affirmation is I am self-determined meaning you make your decisions. I am self-determined by the Holy Spirit or a higher power, and I I let others do the same. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of what you mean here. Um, An example would be that I'm very ready to make decisions. I'm self-determined. I look to what I feel I want and what I need. I ask for advice, and the more serious the decision might be, I inquire of others who have more experience, perhaps. So it's not that I'm loath to check out with others as to what decision I should make, but I look to my own inner being, my own value system, as to what decision I want to make or what would be the right decision 
decision for me with what I believe in. So I want to be self-determined. That's to contrast following the crowd, following the commercial world, <laughs> doing what everybody else says I should do. Right, so right. I, f I follow my own instinct, my own value system, but I ask advice according to how serious this decision is. And I'm willing to change my mind, but I'm also willing to look to the ideas of other people and respect their right, ideas right. and give them time to formulate their ideas, to dialogue with them. What I find interesting about this affirmation is that when you take responsibility for yourself and for your own actions, then you're free. Mm -hmm. Yes. Even if it's painful, even yes. if you have to admit that you're sometimes not doing the right thing, you're free when you assume mm -hmm. responsibility for yourself. And you're willing to believe more in yourself if somebody encourages you to say, what do you think? Right. Because we're, we're not trained to think. We're trained to follow. Right. Because when you say, I'm self-determined, you're mm -hmm. making your own decisions and mm -hmm. you're responsible for your mm -hmm. own decisions, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, you said something about, do you think people, is this a good affirmation for, because we are so busy that we don't think things through? Yes. Okay. Or we're afraid. See, the, what, what is, what is uh, the prime thing in our negative thinking is fear. We're mm -hmm. fear of what people will think of us. We're fear of uh, we'll sound funny or dumb. We're just afraid that somebody will make a judgment uh, on us, and people do. Uh, and cut us short, or uh, or we've been indoctrinated into, well, what do you know, or uh, um, you always come out with some dumb statement, so why don't you just listen? And and we take that in, and it makes a big difference in the way we approach life and in, in the use of our own unique potential when we don't believe in ourselves. Okay. The last one, I am completely responsible for mm -hmm. all my responses to all people's circumstances and events. Yes. This is kind of about having power over your own emotions. Yes, it would require that. It also means that if you keep saying that, uh, and one reason why we embrace that affirmation would be we can't blame other people. For, what, uh, for the way we respond to life circumstances and events. And we're always looking for somebody to blame. <laughs> you know, I don't it's know. It's always what, somebody else's fault. Remember when, when uh, the Cold War ended and we kind of uh, weren't, we couldn't blame Russia anymore? We were looking all <laughs> over the place now. Who do we blame now? Somebody else must be at fault for what's going wrong in our world. And we couldn't blame the Russians as much as we used right, to, what we right. still do. We'll blame anybody. Well, right now we're in a great point finger pointing time yeah, in our, it's, it's, in our yeah, country. It's really easy and blaming. Take, right. But it's, it's our response, it's, it's our responsibility to how, you know, if a car jumps a curb and a drunk driver breaks both of my legs, I'm not responsible for that accident, but I am responsible as to how I deal with what that accident does to me. I can moan and groan for the rest of my life. I can try to sue him out of his existence. I can do all kinds of things. I don't have to be mamby-pamby about it. I don't have to be Pollyanna-ish about it. I need to exercise some justice and enter into the fray. But I'm responsible for how I respond. Then people will say, well, my husband just walked out on me. I know, but you're responsible for how you deal with those circumstances. Mm -hmm. You can be bitter for the rest of your life, and the poison turns on you. Or you can take hold of the circumstances and the events, move towards forgiveness, take hold of your life, and move forward. Let's talk about how you're supposed to say your affirmations. I understand you repeat each one six times yeah, five in the or morning six times in the yes, evening. In the Why is that? Evening. Why repetition? That's because any habit is formed through repetition. You find out what you want to change or learn how to do. You find out how to do it, and then you repeat, repeat, and repeat. And so the same thing is when you try to diffuse the negative with a positive attitude, which is an affirmation, you decide what you want to change, you write it out in a positive statement, personal, present tense, and then you sit down in the morning, first thing if you can, and the last thing in the evening, and you sit in a chair like this with your feet flat on the floor, and, and you, you sit you upright, and you spread your hands this way on your thighs, you are most relaxed, you sit up straight, you don't lie in a lounge chair because you'll fall asleep, <laughs> and you just say, God loves me, and I like myself unconditionally. And you relax. Sister, how yeah. do you know you're living smart? 
How do you know you're living smart? Well, when I saw that title, I thought it was a, a nice little catchy phrase. <laughs> but the older I get, uh, smart sets up for me a kind of a competitive attitude. And so uh, I know when I'm living smart is when I know I'm living wisely. And what do you mean by living wisely? Uh, making choices according to the values that I want to live by, my love of God, my love of people, um, my willingness to wait and listen, uh, my willingness to change my mind, my willingness to be challenged, um, my sense of peace within myself. I know I'm, I'm living wisely. Thank you so much, Sister, for joining us. For me, the affirmations have changed my life. So if mm-hmm. anything I can share with you is that it really has helped me with my self-esteem. So I Good. think it does work, and Good. I've been doing it for 15 years now since I met you. Thank you so much. Thank you for And for more information share. on Sister Elizabeth and her course, Effective Living at the Seneca Retreat House, you can check our website, HoustonPBS.org slash Living Smart, where you'll find a complete resource list. Feel free to share your own views on effective living. You can call us with your comments at 713 743 513 or email livingsmart at houstonpbs.org. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a fantastic week. Thank you. See how easy that was? Production funding for Living Smart with Patricia Gross is underwritten in part by Halliburton. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.